Привет! If you have quizzes, please bring them down to the front or uh, that's going to, don't put it face down. Mess here, sorry. Okay, you put it face, face up. Any more quizzes out there? Are all the quizzes in? Thank you. Okay, folks, let's get settled in. Okay. So One of, one of the problems with writing your own quizzes is like talking to yourself. You always make sense, right? And I never know how a quiz will go until people actually take it. But I thought that was a pretty straightforward quiz. You know how I know? I can tell when, when nobody finishes a quiz in 30 minutes, you know you're in trouble. Not you, but me, because it means I'm great, my grading is going to be a nightmare. This is about the right balance, okay? I hate, I hate reviewing quizzes right after you've done them, but I also don't, I like to pick scabs off wounds before they heal. So since the wound is fresh, let's pick at it, okay? So on the first problem, what is the main question? What, were, what was that? I know it sounded like I was asking you for a present value, right? But the big part of the problem was coming up with the right discount rate. So help me out here. First, were those cash flows I showed you cash flows to equity or cash flows to the firm? Okay. How can you tell? Because I subtract our debt payments. You're saying, why don't you call it cash flows to equity? But where would the problem go, right? If I gave you the ad, so it was cash flows to equity. So what, what does it mean in terms of discount rates? What discount rate? Cost of, you have to use a cost of equity. As we go through this, don't go through despair. The world hasn't ended if you use the cost of capital, but it's clearly mismatched. Second, what currency were the cash flows in? I hear Dong and I hear Naira. Already you can tell that you didn't get the same quiz as your neighbor. There were two versions of the quiz floating around. I've always done this. I remember once I did this and somebody accused me of being deceptive. And I said, in what way? He said, you never told me my neighbor's quiz was not the same as mine. And I said, what business is it of yours what your neighbor's quiz looks like? You know what your nightmare scenario is, right? You do a perfect solution to the wrong quiz. I hope nobody in this class has done that. It's happened once in the last five years. You're going to have a really tough time explaining to that committee that meets about how this happened. Okay? 
So the first problem is all about first. So the it's a equity. It's to in in a currency, the dong or naira, which means I need a dong or a naira discount rate, and country plays in right because it's in Vietnam or in Nigeria. So I'm going to start with the U.S. dollar cost of equity. I'm going to add on the country risk because I am faced with that country risk. And what's the final piece of the puzzle? What do I have to do to get it from dollar to the? I have to take the differential inflation. Now I'll give you full credit whether you added the number or did the compounding. I'm not here to nitpick. If you did it, if you got to that adding instead of it's full. so, both those answers which will be which will be different because the net present the present value is going to be different. So the key in the first problem is getting the discount rate right. Yeah, you had a question. Okay. Second problem was I think. It's one of those, if you're a, it's a fastball down the middle. But only if you've been hitting fastballs for the last week, which is my way of saying, if you've been doing these problems enough, the second problem was basically very similar to past quizzes. The only thing was I threw in both countries and businesses into the same problem. The country part came in for the equity risk premium part, so you had to look at the breakdown of revenues by country. And the business part came in when I asked you what the beta was in the third part. And the first part, I asked you what the risk-free rate was. So what you have to do is start with the government bond rate, and then you look for a default spread, but it's embedded in the problem, right? Because I gave you the borrowing rate in euros as well. So basically, you can look at the difference or whatever, I don't even remember what currency, but there was a way in which you could back out from the problem what the default spread was. So the second problem is just taking what we did in those six sessions and kind of compressing them into problem. The third problem was a lot easier than it could have been. You know why? Because Bill de Blasio was covering his rear end, and he called a snow day on Monday. You know, that's why NYU had to call it. Our snow day, our days are connected to the public school system, and de Blasio got so much heat for screwing up in the last snowstorm, the city decided to show us how prepared it was by calling a public school holiday for Monday and getting all the snow equipment. Did you see on Monday all the snow equipment lined up to remove snow that wasn't there? Which meant that I was, I could have told you, watch the, the video on Monday and make sure you're ready. But then you'd have bitched and moaned about it for the rest of eternity. So I had to stop at last Wednesday's class. I had a much more interesting prom, which is a nice way of saying it, more difficult prom written. I had to remove it and replace it with the lease problem. And I tried to keep it simple. I gave you the operating income, and I gave you the lease commitments, and I gave you the lease expense. And what was the question? What would the operating income be if you treated leases as debt? This is something you're going to see play out in company after company. So lead me through the process. What do you have to do first? First, you've got to compute the present value of the lease commitments using what discount rate? The pre-tax cost of debt, right? Notice I didn't even try to be tricky and give you a tax rate to see if you'd use the after. I was bending over backwards saying, hey, that was, a, you know. So pre-tax cost of debt, you get a present value. Then what? What is the next step? You can either use the shortcut, in which case you take the present value of the debt, multiply by a pre-tax cost rate, add it to the operating income and say, hey, you did in your notes, you can't blame me for doing the same thing. Or add back the lease expense and subtract out a depreciation you could get by taking the lease commit, the present value, and dividing by three. Straight line depreciation. Okay. So it's over. In corporate finance, you know the notion of a sunk cost? What are we supposed to do with sunk costs? Let them go. So if you did badly on the quiz, just let it go. You know why? Because this was your freebie. That's the good news. The bad news is this was your freebie. Okay? You can't count on it again. But it is, you know, always look forward. I mean, it's, it's something, otherwise you're going to find prior quizzes get in the way of the next quiz. Question. You can do either. You, you know, for equity risk premium, you basically go by revenues because to get the value is convoluted because you, know, you have to know the... But you could actually, if you want to do the business mix and value, that's perfectly okay. Yeah. But re, uh, revenue weights will work fine as well. Okay, so any other questions? How many of you had a chance to watch the Monday session? Okay, at least you're honest. It's out there. It's still hanging out there. It's on YouTube. It'll be on YouTube till I take it off or till they ban me, which you never know could happen. 
So try to get it watched because in the Monday session, I completed the cash flow process. Given that you did not do it, let me very quickly review because since we're going to be building on to growth, might as well review. First, we talked about capitalizing R&D. Okay? Why do we capitalize R&D again? Remind me. Because it's an investment for the future, for future years. And already you can see when we capitalize leases, we're just hitting the tip of the iceberg. We capitalize leases because they're contractual payments. You got to make them in good times, you got to make them in bad times, that's what makes them debt. Can you th think of other expenses like leases where we might want to do the same thing? I'll give you a clue, Netflix. Netflix has its version of contractual commitments. It has leases, but it also has another, you know what it is? How many of you are, have Netflix? Okay. 120 million subscribers. It's tough not to be. And the rest of you probably share. You're probably <laughs> leeching off somebody else's account. So I know you all have Netflix. You open up Netflix, it's like all those movies out there, right? And especially in the old days when it was all external content, other people's movies, how did Netflix get the right to carry these movies? It signed a contractual agreement with Disney or with... Uh, you know, with Paramount Pictures to carry that movie. And the contractual commitment was usually three years, four years, five years. If you take a look at, I know there are a couple of people in the class who are doing Netflix. Take a look at their contractual commitments. You see an operating lease column, which you're going to treat as debt from this day on if you're an accountant. But there's a second column that says content commitments. That's what they committed to pay for the movies they're carrying on Netflix. If I'm valuing Netflix, that's debt to me as well because that's a contractual commitment. You see that accountants have gotten rid of the lease problem, but this is part of a much bigger problem. In fact, I'll give you one final example. It's offbeat. I'm a Yankee fan. And if you have Red Sox fans in there, please don't admit it to me, please. You know, just keep it secret. But I remember in 2009 when the new Yankee Stadium opened, I decided I wanted to take all of my kids to the new Yankee Stadium on, on opening day. So they could tell their grandkids I was there when the stadium was opened. So I would make this offer to all four of my kids. We'll go to opening day. I had to decide to leave my daughter home because her counter question to me was, will there be Dippin' Dots there? Have you ever eaten Dippin' Dots? These are like little ice cream cubes. And I said, Kendra, why does it matter that are Dippin' Dots? She said, if I don't get Dippin' Dots, I don't want to come. So I said, you don't need to come. I don't want to spend half the game looking for Dippin' Dots in a new stadium where I have no idea where it sells. So I took my three sons to opening day. There's a point to this story. Just hang in there. So opening day, we sit on our seats in the bleachers because I had to buy the seats on StubHub. I didn't want to pay certain prices. And we watched the Yankees run onto the field. And all I can think about was debt and equity. You're saying, you are sick. Because here's what I saw. I, got, I saw a guy called Mark Teixeira run to first base, and as he ran, I saw a $23 million contractual commitment for seven years run there with him. <laughs> then I turned to second base. I was a cheap infielder, a guy called Robinson Cano. He was young. He was still you know, $9 million for five years. So, okay, that's then I turned towards shortstop. This is a legend, Derek Jeter, but thank God his contract only three years left to run, 14 million a year. Then I turned to third base, and there was some imposter standing there. The guy who was supposed to be there was a guy called Alex Rodriguez, and if he'd run onto the base, I'd have passed up, because that was $27 million a year every year for the next 10 years. I call it Cashman's folly. If you have no idea who Cashman is, just let it go. On the mound, was a guy called C.C. Sabathia, 25 million for six years. And behind the mound, was a guy called Jorge Posada, 15 million for three years. When I got home, I computed the present value of the contractual commitments the Yankees had just in their infield, and I came up with $660 million. If I'm valuing the Yankees, that is debt to me. I should be treating it as debt. The Yankees might have no conventional debt on their balance sheet, but they have a lot of debt. If you have no idea what I was talking about because you've never watched baseball and you watch soccer, next time you watch A.C. Barker run onto the field, think contractual commitments. It'll take all the fun out of the game. But think about how in professional sports you have these multi-year contracts. When you sign a contract, you're essentially taking on debt whether you want to or not. So the, the contractual commitments essentially become debt. 
With R&D, the argument I made was this is actually capital expenditure, so we should capitalize R&D. Yes? Well, be very careful. The word sell the players has <laughs> connotations I don't particularly like. But you can sell contracts. Though you're not selling the player, you're selling the contract to somebody else. Okay. You can sell debt as well. That doesn't mean you don't count it as debt when you do it, right? So in a sense, the fact that you can pass debt on with an asset doesn't mean you don't count it as debt while it's with you, right? So you might try to escape from these big contracts by bringing down debt. And you can do the same thing with conventional debt, but it's still debt. Now, does everybody buy into my notion of why R&D is a capital expenditure? My argument is a very simple accounting 101 argument, which is if capital expenditures are expenditures create, designed to create benefits over many years, R&D is capex. So about seven years ago, I was asked to give a keynote at the AICPA conference in Vegas. For whatever reason, accountants put their, I know what the reason is, you get big ballrooms in Vegas. So a thousand accountants in a room. And I had to give a keynote. This is as close to my vision of hell as I can get. Be trapped in a, a thousand accountants in a room in Vegas. And actually, the presentation I gave was 10 things that accountants do that I don't quite understand. And I threw the thing about leases out there. And they said, we're working on it. We've been working on it for 47 years. One of these days, we'll get it. But then I raised this issue of, hey, why do you guys screw up R&D so badly? Why do you expense R&D? You know what? the answer they gave was, right, as to why they expense R&D. Somebody gave me this answer last session as well, but let's pull the answer out. Why do accountants expense R&D? What's the rationale? The benefits are too uncertain. As I said in the last class, that is not a good argument, because you could make that argument about traditional capex, right? You build a factory to make new cell phones. How the hell do you know whether you'll sell any? You might have to shut the factory down. There's uncertainty about everything. We've never used uncertainty as a dividing line for any other capex. Why just selectively with R&D? The second argument they gave, so very quickly that argument dissipated, so it's gone. The second argument they gave was, we're just accountants, we're being conservative. In what sense is expensing R&D conservative? It's lowering your income, right? So you're right, you're lowering, reporting lower income than higher income. It's a conservative thing to do. But when you expense something, what do you show in your books? That's a trick question. You show nothing. Right? When you expend something, it's gone. So what are you doing when you're expensing? You're reporting lower income, but you're taking that asset off your book. So when I compute something like return on equity or return on invested capital for your company, say, are you a good company? Because you're not bringing your biggest assets onto the books, guess what I'm going to find as my return on equity or return on capital for a technology or a pharmaceutical company? A really high number because your biggest asset is not in the denominator. That's not conservative to me. I want to know whether you make a 12% return or a 35% return. And if you're claiming to make a 35% return when you're making 12, that's a problem. That's why we capitalize R&D. Capitalizing R&D doesn't change your free cash flow one cent. You know why? Because you spend the money anyway. What you spend is operating or capital and money leaving the company. What capitalizing R&D does is it gives you a much better sense of profitability. You're probably more profitable than you claim, but you're also less, you, your returns that on, on your invested capital are far lower than you claim. That is central to valuation. You need to know it, and that's why we capitalize R&D. But again, R&D is just the tip of the iceberg. If you think about why we capitalize R&D, you could make the same argument about exploration costs for oil companies, about advertising costs for big consumer product companies, or recruiting and training costs for a consulting firm or a bank. Your biggest asset is being built up with that expense. And in fact, this is becoming a big issue with social. Yesterday when I was valuing Lyft, um, and you can see I, I did a few tweaks because I discovered a few time bombs in the prospectors that I had to bring in. Okay. One of the things that you will notice, a big chunk of their expenses is for customer acquisition, acquiring writers. And if you're an Uber or a Lyft, you could make a legitimate argument that some of those expenses are really not expenses designed to create a benefit this year. They're designed to build yourself up as a company. I'm open to that argument. The question I would then have for Lyft or Uber to make, put that, what would I need to know? Because when I capitalize R&D, what did I do? I asked for an amortizable life, right? And then I went and collected. So if, I, if, you add, if you give me that argument that customer acquisition costs are really capex, What's the one question you need to ask to, to actually treat it as CapEx? What do I need to know? 
how long does a customer stay on as a customer? So if you're acquiring customers, but they leave in three months or six months, it's just constant rollover, then it's really not a capex. You're not getting it for the, but if a typical customer stays on for five, six, or seven years, then in a sense, I have exactly the same rationale for capitalizing customer acquisition costs as I do for R&D. I know we're opening a can of worms here because it basically means that nothing is as it looks, right? That income statement is not really the income statement because you're redoing it. But I think we need to kind of get past this conventional accounting definition of what expenses are because those expenses no longer fit the kinds of companies we're looking at. And then in the rest of the class, here's what I did. I asked about tax rates. What tax rate should I use? Now, remember I asked the same question when we did cost of debt? There the answer was always the marginal tax rate. Why? Because at the margin, interest saves you taxes. So if your marginal tax rate is 30%, you're going to find a way to get the tax benefit. But when we do after-tax income, the tax rate could be the effective tax rate, at least for the near term. Why? Because if you have good tax deferral strategies, you might be able to pay 15% in taxes instead of 25%. I'm going to give you the credit for it, but I'm going to put a time limit on it. I'm not going to let you defer taxes forever because you can't do that. So as you move towards your terminal value, I'll push your tax rate up to your marginal tax rate. The rest of the session was about tying up what's capex, what's working capital. And the only common theme that was don't take the number on the statement of cash flows and use that as a number in valuation because what accountants call capex might not capture R&D and other expenses like it. What else does it not capture? What's the other big capex that's missed? If you're in a hurry to grow as a company, what's the quickest way to grow? Go out and do acquisitions. I've never understood why we have two pathways, one for traditional cap. Acquisitions are just gigantic capital expenditures. And if that's the way you grow, I'm not penalizing you. I'm going to give you the benefits of that growth, but this is now going to become the cost of that growth. I close the session by talking about growth. Hey, if you were, when you sit down to value your company, you've picked the company, right? I never asked you that question, but I assume by this point you've picked the company. I shouldn't be nagging you anymore. When you sit down to value the company and you try to project growth, what's the most natural place to start? You look, you look backwards, right? What did they grow at? Last? It's where most of us start. It's, 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 it's a standard place to start. And I said, well, when we think about past growth, we treat it as a fact. We look it up. Capital IQ as a historical growth rate. So we treat it as a fact, but I opened this can of worms again and think, maybe it's not a fact. And here's why historical growth can be an estimate. First, it depends on how far back you go, right? The growth rate you get going back three years might be very different than if you go back five years or 10 years. In fact, a very good trick you can use to make your growth rate look high is to pick a base year that was a terrible year. You know, this year, if you're looking at 10-year growth rates, companies are going to look amazing across the board. I'm going to make a general statement. Why? 2009 is going to become your base year. If you're building off 2009, any year you look at is going to look like nirvana. So it depends on how far back you go. Second, it depends on how you compute the growth rate. There are two ways you can compute growth rates. You can compute growth rate every year for 10, add the numbers up and divide by 10. That's a simple average. Or you can look at what the earnings were in 2009, what they are today, and look at a compounded average growth rate. You think, how different can they be? And that's the last table I looked at, where I looked at three measures of operating, or three operating measures for Motorola, revenues, EBITDA, and EBIT. And I computed both arithmetic and geometric averages, a compounded average for each of them. On revenues, the arithmetic average was 7%. The geometric average was 6.8%. You're saying, we did all this work to get that little of a difference? But then when I looked at, you know, at, at EBITDA or EBIT, you saw the differences widen. And the reason is very simple. The only way those two numbers are going to converge is if I have the same growth rate every year. If I have 8%, 8%, 8%, 8%, 8% then the, the two numbers will converge. The greater the standard deviation in earnings, the more the geometric average growth rate is going to lag the arithmetic average growth rate. Sounds like inside statistics, but here's why it matters. If I'm a company trying to frame the best possible story for myself, I'm going to use the arithmetic average growth rate because it's going to make me look good. That's my choice. But your choice then has to be to push back and say, hey, what was the compounded growth rate over the period? 
arithmetic average versus geometric average, and there are a few other loose ends. One is we have negative earnings, and this is the last thing I did. How do you compute a growth rate? You're minus a dollar, you go to a plus a dollar. The face of it, that was a good year, right? But if I use any conventional growth rate computation, I get really weird numbers. In fact, if I go from minus a dollar to plus a dollar and I compute the growth rate as a change in earnings divided by the earnings last year, which is the way you compute growth, I get minus 200%. You're saying that makes no sense. It makes complete mathematical sense. It just doesn't make intuitive sense that you went from negative to positive, and now you're telling me the growth rate is negative. And people play all kinds. I've seen people spend half a day trying to fix the problem. And actually, it's easy to fix, right? What's the problem? You have a minus in front. So what's the quickest way out of the problem? Let's draw another line going the other direction. Minus becomes plus. Then put a mathematical patina on it by saying, I use the absolute earnings level from the previous year. You have a plus 200% growth rate. There goes your intuitive problem to explain away. The other is the denominator is a negative number, right? That's what's causing the problem. Use the higher of the two earnings, in which case, again, you get a number that might be a positive number. But the truth is, when earnings go from negative to positive, a growth rate that you compute becomes not meaningful. Don't look at the end game here. It's not to compute the growth rate last year. It's to forecast the growth in the future. Using past growth rate becomes dicey when you go negative, positive. Po ne so if you have a company that goes back and forth between the two, might as well not look at the past growth rate. One final point about historical growth. So the numbers can be different depending on how far back you go, how you compute the average, whether you're looking at revenues, EBITDA, or EBIT, or net income, or earnings per share. We do all of this because we think knowing how quickly companies have grown in the past helps us forecast a better future, right? So might as well raise a question. Does knowing the historical growth rate give you better predictors of the future? Now, I'm not throwing that question out for you to think about because that's an empirical question. It's not a theoretical question. And about 50 years ago, somebody from, you know, I think his name was IMD Little. That was his name. I'm not making up stuff. He came out here to do a PhD thesis in, in economics slash finance. It's the 1950s. And he decided to try to address a question. Doesn't, and um, I, I'll tell you what the title of his thesis was. And you can probably guess what he found. Because what's the question he's trying to answer? Is knowing past growth, does it help predict future growth? The title of his thesis was Higgledy Piggledy Growth. Higgledy Piggledy Growth. What do you think he found? He found no, in fact, there are two possible good ways, good, good answers you could have got. A really high positive correlation, which means if you have high growth in the future, you get high growth, I'm sorry, in the past, you get high growth in the future. Or a big, remember, there are two kinds of great predictors. One who's right all of the time, and one who's wrong all of the time. Because either way, you make money, right? The guy who's right all the time, you do whatever he asks you to do. The guy who's wrong all the time, you do the opposite of whatever he asks you to do. The worst possible scenario for you is if the correlation is zero, and that's what he found. That's a scary number. Think of how often we pay premiums for companies. Why? Because they've had a high growth rate in the past. Historical growth is nice to know, but it doesn't seem to help you very much in forecasting future growth. Final two points, and this is what I want to finish historical growth with. When you compute the historical growth rate for your company, one thing you've got to watch is whether the scale of your company changed or how much it changed over the period. You're saying, well, let me give you an example. The early 90s, a company called Callaway Golf came out of nowhere and essentially became this incredible success. You know what the, their product was, right? What did Callaway Golf come out with that made them this incredibly successful company? Big Bertha, a golf club. Right? So if you don't play golf, you say, really? It's a golf club. And remember, people who play golf are constantly looking for a magic bullet. Give me a better golf club. Give me a better. So basically, people feed into that, that wound. And Big Bertha came out. And to show you how successful Big Bertha was, this is the net profit for Callaway Golf. And this was in 97. Looking back, in the five years leading into 97, their compounded average growth rate was 102% a year. So this is one of those companies, arithmetic average, geometric, and you can do any slicing and dicing. It had an incredibly successful five years. It's a fact. So now you're in 1997, and you're forecasting growth for the next five years. Forget what I told you about growth not being predictable. Let's suppose you say, hey, this is a great company. It's got a great product. I'm going to forecast the growth for the next five years. 
let us say just as a what if, I took the 102 percent growth rate I had for the last five and used it as my growth rate for the next five. Here is what my net profit will look like, I am sorry, if I keep going for the next five years. If I keep growing at 100 percent, my net income by the time I get to 2001 would be 4.1 billion dollars. Every valuation you are telling a story. So if I showed you these numbers, what is the story I am telling you about Callaway Golf? That they found a way to make a big Bertha have uses you never thought of. A weapon, it is a mass murder instrument, it's, I mean it is hundreds of different uses. It is an inconceivable story, but you can see how taking past growth rate for small companies. and That is the thing I had to constantly worry about with the lift projections. Because this is a company that has gone from nothing, still does not make money, but in terms of revenues into this big number, right? whether it is 2 billion or 2.2 billion, it has gone from almost nothing to 2. Point. If I compute the past growth rate, I am going to get really impressive numbers. And even if I like the company now, I cannot just use those growth rates going forward because I am going to get numbers I cannot sustain. So be careful about small companies becoming big and taking those growth rates and extrapolating from them. So that is your first stop is you can try past growth rates. So let us say you try for your company and it does not work. Your second stop will be to look outside, say please give me a growth rate. You know that in third of all valuations, perhaps more, if you ask people how did you come up with the growth rate, the answer is the management gave it to me. In fact, many private company appraisals, the growth rate comes from management. And in public companies, there is a resource that many of you are going to be able to draw on as you sit to value a company, which is analysts follow your company and they are going to project a growth rate for your company. So these are sell side equity research analysts. They populate investment banks. There are 15 analysts, 20 analysts, 25 analysts. Companies like Apple have 75 analysts. And to give you a short description of an analyst job, here is how it works. You are hired as a sell side equity research analyst and you are given a sector. It might be a sector you like, a sector you do not like. You want the job. So if they give you telecom, you are going to take it if that is what they give you. You would love to have technology. But they start you with the really boring sectors that nobody wants. So you are now the gold mining analyst. You know what the rest of your life looks like? You will have 12 companies that you track for the rest of your life. And your entire focus is the gold mining stocks. Your, the rest of the universe ceases to exist. Your focus remains sector specific. That is how sell side equity research is designed. Why? Because you're supposed to get knowledge of that sector, they want you to stay within that sector. And you spend an insane amount of your time forecasting earnings per share next quarter. Equity research is a pricing game. When we talked about value versus pricing game, if you're really good at forecasting what next quarter's earnings per share are going to be, you never need to know 1% of discounted cash flow valuation. You never need it because you make money in the pricing game. Spend a lot of time forecasting growth and earnings. What I'm setting up for is they're immersed in the sector, they talk to the management, they spend all their time with these companies. Their growth rate projections must be much better than the rest of us, right? So for about 20 years, people have asked this question: are the growth rates that analysts forecast for companies better than what you'd have got if you just used past data? Because remember, all of us have access to past data on capital IQ. We can and the results are actually surprisingly moderate in terms of the gain. In fact, I'm using the word moderate as uh, I'm probably exaggerating even with that word. And here's how you see it. See that first column? That is the standard error you get. And you want this number to be a small number. If it's absolutely precise, you'll have a zero percent forecast error. So the first study, analyst forecasts, the standard error is about 31.7 percent. It's not zero percent. They're not getting it perfect. But you wouldn't expect them to. But if you just took past data and forecast out earnings, you get a standard error of 34.1 percent. That's a 2.4 percent savings in standard error. And think of how much money we're paying equity research analysts to save this. And that's with one quarter ahead forecast. As you go to two quarter ahead, one year ahead, five year forecast, even that disappears. And that's a mystery. Why? I mean, these are smart people. They have access to all this data. They can talk to the management. They know everything you can, as it happens. In the, how come the payoff is not greater? And I have, and, and oh, one more thing. If you, pre, if you present, the, I mean, I've done this to sell side equity research analyst conferences. They get defensive for obvious reasons. And the way they deal with this is they say, it wasn't us. It's those guys outside. We're the good analysts. 
And in fact, there's a subset of sell-side equity research analysts who consider themselves great analysts. They're anointed. Institutional investor for about 40 years has created what's called an all-America team of analysts, like a football, the, in a, the college football and college basketball. They were all, so basically, they go into each sector, and you're anointed as the all-America analyst. And if you're a sell-side equity research analyst, this is like the gold standard. Once it's affixed to you, you attach it to your name. From that day on, you're Jeff Brown, all-America analyst. It will increase your income. It will increase your human capital. So they said, well, those analysts must be better, right? So somebody actually looked at the all-American analysts to see if they were better at forecasting earnings than the rest of the analysts. After all, they were anointed as the best of them. And they found something very strange. In the year before they got picked as sell-side analysts, or as all-American analysts, they were actually slightly worse in forecasting than the typical analysts. But in the year after they were picked, they magically got a little better than the typical analyst. Now, you could use this as an ad for self-esteem courses. If your self-esteem goes up, you get a better. But what do you think explains it? How, you know, first, why would these guys become all-America analysts if they're not very good at forecasting? Well, it must be the criteria that gets used for all-America analysts has nothing to do with forecasting, right? So what do you think is the biggest single determinant for whether an analyst becomes an all-American analyst? It's not forecasting accuracy. It's not stock picking skill. You know what it is? It's how high your profile is the community. You think, what do you mean? If you get quoted every day in the Wall Street Journal, even if you say incredibly stupid things every conceivable day, you have, you're well on path to be an all-American analyst because people know your name. They, don't, they forget everything. This is why people say stupid things. Outrageous things, because you get quoted, your name's there. It's cynical, but it's got nothing to do with forecasting. But then how do they magically become better at forecasting after they get picked? That affects the stock price. So if, you, if I'm trying to ask why a stock price is more affected by recommendations, that's your answer. And that, in fact, they're strong. But why would your forecasting get better? But again, you're going to, are they doing better pricing? I just want to know, why is their earnings per share forecast better? I mean, because this has nothing to do with following. It's got, eh? Who's the, what's the biggest source of private information in analysts? It's basically the company. Let's face it. I know the SEC owes all these disclosure requirements that you dance back and forth across the line. But the reality is, if you look at where information comes to analysts, it comes from companies. You think, so what? Year before, you became an all-American analyst. You called the company. This is Jeff Brown, equity research analyst for XYZ Bank. Can I talk to the CEO? No, he's too busy for you. Come to the equity research conference. Phone's hung up. Year after, you become all-American analyst. You say, this is Jeff Brown, all-American analyst. Could I talk to the CEO right away? CEOs recognize that you now have a bigger following. It's, you know, it's cynical, but it's reality. And if you look at recommendations, interesting things happen. Not only do your recommendations have bigger room on them if you're an all-American analyst, but here's a strange asymmetry, and perhaps you can explain it to us. When, when analysts put out buy recommendations, the stock price tends to get bumped up. You've seen this in reports, right? Wall Street Journal say stock went up 3% because JP Morgan put a buy recommendation on Tesla. And if you track these buy recommendations six months later, the 3% is usually dissipated. There's still some holding on, but most of the 3% or big chunk of the 3% goes away. So when you buy a recommendation, there's a bump of about 3% and then a very quick. So it's not much of an impact. But when you have a sell recommendation, first you have a drop on the sell recommendation of about 5%. But here's what's different. If you track the stock three months or six months later, that 5% has become almost 14%. So why do sell recommendations have a much bigger impact and a more lasting impact than you think than buy recommendations? They're rare. In fact, you know, you know what the ratio of buy to sell recommendations in the market is about eight buys for every sell. It used to be like 18 buys before 2000. Now it's eight buys. So it's a little more balanced, I guess. So when you see a sell recommendation, you know that this analyst has to be really, really down on a stock to put sell on it. 
And perhaps he's bringing some information that you would not buy, see with the buy recommendation. So what I'm saying is you own a stock and you see a sell recommendation, it has much more effect on the price of your stock and perhaps you should worry more than if there's a buy recommendation because the buy recommendations often have far less behind them. So I've thought about this for a while. Because, you know, as you know, over 36 years and 34 years of teaching valuation, a lot of people in this class used to go to sell-side equity research. Not as much anymore because the business has shrunk. But I wondered, why do sell-side equity research analysts not bring more oomph to the game? Why do they not create more of an effect? And I've, con I've thought about five possible reasons. One is what is this tunnel vision that comes from the way your job is designed. What did I say you had as a gold mining analyst? All you care about are the 13 gold mining stocks. You're the, let's say the ride sharing companies all go public. You'll be covering Lyft and Uber and DD and Grab Taxi and Ola. And if I told you Lyft trades at seven times revenue, you say, that's cheap. You know why? Because the other four companies trade at 12 times revenues. Your frame of reference gets skewed because you're so sector focused, you've forgotten the rest of the world. This is how you can end up with these outrageous pricing in sectors, whether it's dot com or social media or ride sharing, and nobody notices. The second is what I call lemmingitis. You'll often see re equity research analysts, often not, not so many with the recommendations, but revise earnings for a company. They'll, they'll say, We've increased our earnings forecast for this company by 7% for next quarter. What's the news for the next three days? Because you know, you know what you're going to see, right? A lot of other analysts following the company will also say, oh, you know what? We also discovered something. Coincidentally, that makes the earnings go up 5%. Nobody wants to be left out. So they don't even know why the guy raised the earnings 7%, but they say, I don't want to be left out. He probably knows something that I don't. I'll raise. So there's a lot of lemmingitis where you don't want to be left behind. The third is there's a version of the Stockholm Syndrome that seems to kick in here. What is the Stockholm Syndrome? It became, you know, it was documented in the 70s in a lot of kidnappings. And what people documented is when you get kidnapped, after a while you start to identify with the kidnappers more than the people trying to rescue you. It's called the Stockholm Syndrome. I guess a lot of these people must have been kidnapped in Stockholm. So don't ask me why it's called the Stockholm Syndrome. But it's a well-documented phenomenon. You think, what's this got to do with sell-side equity research? If you think about the design of sell-side equity research in an abstract world, your job is to look at companies with a skeptical and a cynical eye and try to value companies from the outside end, right? But here's the problem. You're the gold mining analyst. You've followed 13 gold mining stocks. You've done it for 22 years. Do you know all these gold mining CEOs really well? You probably play golf with them. You, one of them is probably the godfather of your child. Uh, the Stockholm Syndrome, at some point in time, you forget your job is to be questioning, but you think your job is to defend the company at all comers. If you want to see a company where Stockholm Syndrome has gone crazy, take a look at Tesla. Tesla has no sell-side equity research analysts. It has people who defend it against other people, who masquerade as sell-side analysts for Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, etc. They've lost all perspective. And then there's factophobia. I'm amazed. You pick up a sell-side equity research report, first at the bulk, 50 pages, 75 pages of story after story after story with nice graphs, three-dimensional graphs, nothing to do with the company. There's nothing wrong with storytelling. Remember, we said all, but if you're going to tell a story, it has to have a purpose. It has to be connected to things. But some analysts, it's all storytelling all the time. And finally, you do have this conflict of interest that's embedded in I said sell-side equity research analysts work where? They work at the investment banks. And how do sell-side equity research analysts get paid? They get paid by the bank, but when you do research, the research is free. This is a strange business model, right? You're giving away your research. But who do you hope to get in return? You hope that the people who get your research will use your investment bank for other services. It's the unspoken, hey, you know what? Come through us. Your trading happens through us. If you have investment banking stuff to do, maybe you'll use us as well. It's not your fault. It's the way it's designed. But when you want to put a sell recommendation on a really big client for the bank, I know there's a Chinese wall, but come on. You can see through that wall. It's a transparent wall. And the other side, you must say, don't do it. Don't do it. You can see him waving. You can't hear him. Yeah? 
Because he knows you put a sell recommendation. He's putting what hundreds of millions, or you're putting hundreds of millions of dollars of potential banking fees at risk. So the design of sell side equity research is almost, I mean, I've seen really bright people go to sell side equity research, get chewed up and spit out. Because this, the process is the problem, the way we structured it. So if we want sell side equity research, to make a comeback, because it is in fact a dying business as you look at it over time. It's being outsourced, it's shrinking. You gotta redesign it, you gotta do it differently. But that's not my, uh, that's not my job to do, but if you do uh, end up being head of sell-side equity research at investment bank, a couple of my students are sell heads of sell-side equity research, well, then why don't you revamp it? They're, ve they're very nervous to do it because of, this is the way the game is played. But that's, I think, something you wanna keep in mind. So here are my basic propositions about using analyst growth. First is there's far less information in analyst growth rates than you think. They don't know stuff you don't. Second, the biggest source of information to most sell side equity research analysts remains the company. And that's a problem because it might be a source of information, but it's also biased. Because a company has some spin and they're using, you're like a jur journalist with a politician who feeds you stuff. Don't expect, that's nice you have a source. But don't tell me the source is unbiased. Okay? And finally, there is value. I'm not saying don't look up the growth rate for your company, but remember the growth rate you're gonna find for your company. When you look up IBEST or any of these services, Yahoo Finance, it's an analyst growth rate, it's a growth rate in earnings per share. And what you're trying to forecast is growth in revenues, growth in operating income. So go look up the growth rate, the historical growth in the analyst growth rate, but don't let that growth rate become the growth rate for your company, because then you've lost control of your valuation. I will see you on Monday. Oh, incidentally, on the, on the quiz, I wanted to tell you, here's what will happen. I will grade your quiz. So I'll start grading at about 5 o'clock today because I have to teach to 5. When the grading is over, I will put your quizzes out face down alphabetically. That's why I made you write the names on the back because it will be face down. Do not browse. You know where your name is in the alphabet. Just take your quiz out. But I will let you know when it's out there so you can come pick it up. It'll come with a solution guide so you can see how I graded your quiz. So you'll, find, you'll know as soon as I put it out there. comes out at the minute you ask the question, because if you put a forecast of oil prices in, the evaluation, you can almost predict what's going to happen, right? Because if your forecast is oil price will double over the next 10 years, I'll save you the trouble. Your yeah. stock is going to look under value. But then I ask you, why do you like this company? Your answer is going to be, because I think oil prices will double. All and then you have a problem, because if you're really right about that, there's a much easier way for you to make money, right? I'll buy oil too. Exactly. So, when you're valuing companies, you want to keep your macro views out of the picture. You want to kind of take the embedded oil price and the, f the futures price, if you do, which might be on 2% higher each year. Use that in your forecast. So you're essentially doing an oil price neutral valuation of your company. Okay. And you're saying, I like this company at current oil price. And the way it helps me is if I have a view on oil price each year, I can increase the payoff that I get from the view by buying a cheap oil company because then I get two things working for me. Oil prices go up, I get my price going up, plus I get the jump from buying a cheap company. So when you value oil companies, when you value technical companies, you want to keep your max up. Thank you. Yeah. With respect to R&D, yeah. the added back the more tax benefit. Um, That's because right now R&D expenses are tax deductible. That might replace R&D with an amortization of R&D. 
I'm, that number is smaller. So I'm kind of, if I forget about it, then I'm missing some of my tax benefits. So that's my explicit way of bringing the tax benefits. There's actually an easy way to do it. If you make the adjustment already on after-tax operating income, you're effectively bringing in the tax benefit already because you take the actual tax. Right, because when we do the calculation here, we're increasing EBIT before when you do the yeah, If you do it we're before, then you've got... Exactly. So yeah. that's why I did back. But if you do it on the after-tax operating income, mm -hmm. you don't have to do the tax benefit separately. It's already in the And then I know we're adding back the current year's R&D to... Yeah. And then we're also adding Subtract. to depreciation to the uh, depreciation. So free cash flow doesn't change the firm. But from the lease perspective, free cash flow would increase, right? Yeah. Because we're not adding because your free, your free cash flow to equity will not change when you capitalize leases. 